For last day's conditions, special preparation is available, which is the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not a rare bonus for just top-ranked Christians. It is needed for all of us. This anointing is a fire that was lit at the altar of Calvary, and those who receive it become wielders of the divine flame, incinerating the works of Satan. We have nothing to fear if we keep the anointing of God upon our lives. We can outmatch every giant in the enemy's lines. Say to God, now bid me run and I will strive with things impossible. Today the world is the enemy of those who love Jesus. It knows nothing of the anointing of the Lord. The world has its armor like Goliath of Gath, its helmet of education, its spear of science, its sword of reason, its shield of cold indifference. But God has his anointed Davids today. Not one, but millions. Our job is to preach the gospel. Remember, the gospel is no gospel at all if it is not preached. We are anointed for that. Samuel did not anoint David for cosmetic purposes. It wasn't to make him smell nice or give him a pleasant experience. It was for the tasks of kingship and service. Our Holy Spirit anointing is not for a thrill or to add to our charm. It is for action. Marine scientists have discovered that under the surface of the ocean, waves move thousands of miles, even across calm stretches. They eventually approach land, developing a majestic crescendo. Today, from across the centuries, great swells of Holy Spirit power are coming upon us. They once seemed to be submerged, but are now bursting upon our coast in splendor worldwide. For 1,500 years, the church pushed the Holy Spirit aside. There was little understanding of the work of the Spirit. They talked about grace, not the Holy Spirit. Then in the 20th century, he showed himself to believers everywhere. Today, we appreciate God's Spirit and we look for his anointing. However, he has always been present, at work, though unrecognized. The gospel is a firelighter. The Holy Spirit is not given just to help you preach eloquent sermons. That's right. He is to put a flame into human hearts. Amen. He makes his servants flames of fire. Mm. The first things ever said about Jesus when he came was, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is what Jesus does. Only Jesus baptizes with fire. Mm. It is the identifying hallmark of his activity. Mm. Our God is a consuming fire. Mm. Such an amazing statement was never made about anybody else. Fire is the end sign of the gospel, mm. the sign of the Son of Man. Now, 
If you want the fire, let me tell you how to receive it. When Elijah prayed on Mount Carmel, the fire did not fall on an empty altar. Mm. The Lord sends the fire when we lay out our offering, mm. our time, our money, and effort. Mm. It is sent to make us get up steam and go. Mm. The fire of God is not given for a firework display, but for eternal purposes. Mm. Yes, right. By the way, there is a difference between man's fire and God's fire. Mm. Elijah was a fiery type of a man. James said, Elijah was a man of like passions to ourselves. His own passions made him angry at the sin of Israel. Mm -hmm. His passionate hatred of idolatry mm -hmm. burned against the religion of Baal, which Queen Jezebel had introduced. Mm -hmm. But Elijah did not fight the devil out of his own anger. He called on God's fire. Mm -hmm. The fire of religious zeal can be dangerous too. For example, before his conversion, Paul burned with a false fire of religious hatred. Mm. He was a dragon man, as scripture says, breathing out murderous threats and slaughter. Mm. This was cold fury. Mm. He put men and women into prison, broke up homes, brought misery and fear in his religious zeal. Mm. Paul's violent passion, however, turned to gentle compassion when he met Jesus. Mm. Fury became fellow feeling. Mm. Paul found a God of Calvary love. Mm. Calvary was a volcano of love. Our own passions and zeal will not carry us through. Mm. They come and go. That is false fire. Yes. With God it is not passion, but compassion. Yes. He has no moods. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Love yes. never fails. Yes. That is the zeal, the fire, and the divine firepower which comes by the Holy Spirit when we put our all on the altar for God. The fire of God is not just sent for the enjoyment of a few emotional experiences, however glorious they may be. We want to see lives changed and our churches filled. I think of this when I see these now almost extinct old steam engines puffing away. These iron horses are like living creatures, breathing steam with fire in their bellies. The fireman's job is to stoke the fire and get a full head of steam going. When the steam pressure is up, the driver can do one of two things. He can either pull the whistle lever or he can turn the lever that directs power to the pistons. The whistle will blow off steam until there is none left, making itself heard for miles around. If power is directed to the pistons, however, the steam can turn the wheels with far less fuss, drawing no attention to itself. The train then rolls away, carrying its load across the land. Thank God for the train whistle. It is important. 
But if blowing a whistle was all that steam could do, making a fire under the boiler and stoking it up wouldn't be worthwhile. The fire of the Holy Spirit brings power. Never mind the noise. Let us apply this power to get on the move. Thunder is justified after lightning has struck. The proper purpose of Pentecost is to get the wheels rolling for God in every church, thereby transporting the gospel across the face of the whole earth. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The church is a goat church, not a sit church. Look outward to where our Lord is moving across the continents. Some are looking inward, everlastingly examining their own souls, incapacitated by introspection. Jesus is saving you. Don't you worry. Now start helping him to save others. If the Holy Spirit has come, then be up and going. He does the work, not you or me. Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel, and woe to them to whom we fail to preach it. absolutely necessary to understand that the Holy Spirit is He, not it. The Spirit is not an impersonal force, a sort of spiritual electricity. The anointing of God is not just power or gifts, but the Holy Spirit Himself. In the Old Testament, all who served God had to be anointed. This is replaced in the New Testament by the Holy Spirit for all believers. The first thing to learn is that anointing is just one of the names of the baptism in the Spirit. There are others. In other words, when we receive the Holy Spirit baptism, we have been anointed. Our anointing flows out of Christ's anointing, and we receive it only from Him. Of His fullness we have all received. When I first arrived in Africa, I made a startling discovery. Africa had not been waiting for me. It seemed as if the people were not interested in the gospel. I tried very hard, but the response was almost zero. I remember I sometimes preached to just five people, wow. and that drove me into a corner. I prayed, I fasted, I agonized before God. I said, this can't be it, and it went over months and almost over years. And then one night, something happened that radically changed everything. I had a dream, but it was a divine dream. Mm. I saw the map of Africa, the whole continent, getting washed in the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ. Mm. And I heard an awesome voice that penetrated my bone and my marrow crying, Africa shall be saved. Uh -huh. I woke up and I said, oh, this is wonderful. But then my German brain started to tick and I said, this is illogical. My ministry has no impact in this tiny country called Lesotho. Now I hear the whole continent shall be saved. How is this going to happen? But God was gracious. The next night, 
I had the same dream. The following night, again the same dream. Four consecutive nights, again and again. I heard that same voice. And then I began to repeat these words. Africa shall be saved. My missionary colleague said to me, Reinhard, you are crazy. Africa, what about here? I said, I don't know. I just know that God says, Africa shall be saved. On strength of that vision, I left that tiny country and I launched out into the whole continent. And I started by visiting another country nearby called Botswana, the capital city Gaborones. When I arrived there at the airport, I walked from the airport to town. Um, suddenly, as I was walking on that street, the power of God came over me. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, can you see over there? I said, yes, it's a stadium. It says National Stadium. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you will preach my word there. Amen. A deep joy flooded my heart. And I went to town. I met the local minister who knew of my coming. And after greeting him, I said to him, let's go to the authorities of the city. I want to hire this stadium for a gospel campaign today in four weeks. Yes. He said, what? What do you want the stadium for? Don't you know that I've got 40 people on a Sunday in my congregation? I said, no, I don't know about your 40 people. All I know is that a few minutes ago, I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit and I want to obey him. He was humble enough. We went to the authorities. I hired the stadium and when I put my signature under the contract, I began to perspire. Somehow in my mind, I already saw myself sitting in a stadium with 40 people. <laughs> <laughs> and so I added a few days of my stay there in Gaborones. I went from church to church to all the clergy there. I said, I'm Reinhard Bonke. I have, in four weeks time, I will have a gospel campaign. Please, let's all work together. Mm -hmm. They looked at me. They said to me, that sounds all good, but who are you? <laughs> I said, I am Mr. nobody, yeah. but I believe it's going to happen. Yeah. They said, anyone can say that. I said, but he really spoke to me. They said, sorry, we've got something else on. And after nobody wanted to cooperate, I kind of woke up and I said to myself, Lord, you told me to preach in the stadium, and this is my agreement with you. I will do the preaching, but you must bring the people. Mm. Peace came into my heart. And I took the next plane back to Johannesburg. Four weeks later, I arrived with my little team. I was well prepared. I had fasted. I had prayed. I was ready. And I prayed, oh, Lord, please let that stadium be filled in the first meeting. Please, dear Lord. The first meeting started. I counted the people that were there, and there were exactly 100, including myself. Oh, yeah. oh. I counted from left to right and right to left, but 100 mm -hmm. is 100 <laughs> no matter what you do. <laughs> So I was quite disappointed. I opened my Bible and I stood up and I started to preach. I had preached maybe 10 or 20 minutes when suddenly something else happened. One woman jumped up on that side and shouted, I've just been healed. Uh -huh. Another one, another one, four, screamed and said, I've just been healed. And I thought, this is funny. Mm -hmm. I didn't even preach about healing. Mm -hmm. And these people are healed. How is this possible? At the end of the service, when I called the sick forward to lay hands on them, according to Mark chapter 16, they shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall be healed. Something else happened that shocked and, and rocked me. 
Everyone I touched collapsed, and they were lying there on the floor, row after row after row. Somebody came running from the back to the front and said, I demand an explanation. What about all these unconscious people on the floor? Mm -hmm. I said, I can't explain. I need an explanation myself. Do you know? He said, no, I don't know. I said, all I can tell you is, I didn't ask these people to lie on the floor. I laid hands on them according to the Bible. And so I suppose what has happened as a result of it, Jesus signs responsible for. Yes, amen. But this is the crux of the matter. One woman had fallen down being blind. She was a blind lady and she stood up seeing. And one man went down as a cripple and came up walking. Mm. And when that woman screamed, I can see, I can see, I can see. Mm. She was known by all the people as having been blind for years. I thought that roof was lifting. The people were shouting and screaming. It was fantastic. The news spread what had happened and the stadium filled up. In a couple of days, it was packed, packed with people, packed to capacity. For the first time in my life, I saw thousands of people getting up, running forward, receiving Jesus Christ as their personal savior, crying tears of repentance. Oh, I thought this heaven had come down to earth. And then one night, towards the end of that campaign, the Lord spoke to me and said, tomorrow I want you to pray in the stadium for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I said, oh Lord, something like this is not done in a stadium. This is done in a closed church meeting. This is a stadium meeting. Ah, the Lord said, in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, Lord, I've learned to obey even if my mind cannot follow, I will do what you said. So I stood up and I told the people, tomorrow I'm going to speak to you about the baptism into the Holy Spirit. And you're going to see something you have never seen before. The next day came. We had a capacity crowd. I was afterwards told that 50% of the population of Gaborones was in that stadium. A short teaching was given on the baptism in the spirit. And then I said, how many of you want this wonderful gift? A large group came forward. I said, now close your eyes, lift your hands. We are going to praise the Lord. But I kept my eyes open. I said, I want to see what God is going to do now. Amen. And then something happened that stunned me. I, I had never seen anything like it. Was it a vision? Was it real? I can't tell. But it was a mighty transparent wave that rolled in from my left side across that stadium. And as I saw it pass over the people, all those people that were touched were all falling to the ground. Masses of people. And I heard them pray in new tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. I was so moved. I'm not a weepy man at all. But I stood there crying like a little boy, shaking for, and weeping. I said, my God, my God, is it possible? Is it possible? Is it possible? That night I learned the lesson for the rest of my life. I said, I vow to God that I will move with this message from Cape Town to Cairo, mm. across this continent and across the world. Yeah. I now see what the answer is to all the woes of mankind. It is a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit Amen. that will break the devil's back. Yes. And this is what we have done for decades ever since, and we have seen nations shaken by the power of God.
power plants and storerooms at your disposal. And you need not worry about it ever failing. As you reach out to lost mankind, the full weight of heaven is behind you. You can rely on the anointing.